Nationally Recognized Standards Panel. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mike Myers. I'm the Lead Force Integration Officer at Army University, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. You'll be hearing presentations from Ms. Lisa Lutz, President and CEO of Solid LLC, Dr. Vijay Krishna, Director, Personnel, excuse me, Personal Credentialing Accreditation Programs at the American National Standards Institute, Mr. Kent Irvin, Chief of Policy and Governance Division within Army University, and Dr. Chris Reynolds, Dean of Academic Outreach and Program Development at American Public University System, on how the Army University can adopt nationally recognized standards. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Ms. Lisa Lutz. As previously stated, Ms. Lutz is the President and CEO of Solid LLC. She has more than 20 years of experience in policy analysis and program evaluation, specializing in education, employment and training, issues related to military service members and veterans. Her work is concentrated on the use of occupational credentialing to promote the professional development of service members and ensure their smooth transition from the military to the civilian workforce. She has performed research, provided policy guidance, and developed programs in this area for numerous organizations, including the U.S. Departments of Defense, Labor, Army, Navy, Air Force, Energy, and Transportation. Her work has led to appointments to advisory committees, committees by four secretaries of Veterans Affairs and to provide subject matter expertise on the implementation of education and credentialing benefits for service members and veterans. She also serves on the American National Standards Institute's Personnel Certification Accreditation Committee. Ms. Lutz's comments will be complemented by Dr. Krishna. Dr. Krishna is the Director, Personnel Credential Accrediting Programs at the American National Standards Institute. He is a recognized expert in the field of personnel certification accreditation and conducts workshops and training globally on creating and implementing personnel certification programs based on the international standards, ISO, IEC 17024. Dr. Krishan has taught graduate levels, courses in leadership, organizational change, learning in adulthood at the George Washington University. He has also published in the Human Resource Development International, Advances in Human Resources, International Journal of Knowledge, Culture and Change Management, Indian Management, and Economic Times. Ms. Lutz. Good afternoon. Used to the mic here. <laughs> so as Colonel Myers said, I have been involved in um, programs to facilitate credentialing of service members and veterans in the related research since the mid-90s, actually. What I thought I'd do for you today um, is to sort of do a retrospective of credentialing since that time and how it has evolved, both on the civilian side and as it more specifically as it relates to the military. Back in the mid-1990s, um, credentialing, and when I'm talking about credentialing, I'm talking primarily about certification and licensure. People use the term differently, but that's my primary focus now. Um, back in the mid-90s, credentialing as a form of establishing workplace competency was a relatively new thing. Higher education has been a focus for hundreds of years, obviously, but certifications and licenses have really only come into play within the past 30 years or so. So back in the mid-90s, there were probably hundreds of national certifications. Um, the military was not really embracing certification and license, primarily because it was such a new concept. But there started to be some anecdotal evidence that said that service members were leaving the military and having a difficult time getting jobs in the civilian sector because they didn't have the certifications and licenses they needed. So that was the beginning of some systematic research on credentialing of service members and veterans. And the American Legion actually sponsored one of the first reports in that area. And their goal was to say, well, what are the occupational areas that are most affected by credentialing? So they kind of honed in on sort of some low-hanging fruit and focused primarily on aviation um, and healthcare occupations and went in and said, okay, to what extent do the are the military affected by those credentialing standards? And they were able to confirm that, yes, folks leaving in those specialty areas were going to have some difficulty um, getting a job if some additional work wasn't done. 
so we had some sense, we're sort of in a, an exploratory phase at this point, and we had some sense of the extent to which credentialing affects people in certain occupational areas. But a congressional commission was established, the Dole Commission, some of you might remember, to look at transitioning of service members and veterans. And they wanted to get a better sense of the other occupational areas that might be affected. So they commissioned a study. And in the late 90s, that study concluded that approximately 30% of military occupations probably had some form of civilian credentialing requirement um, associated with, that, with their civilian counterpart jobs. So by the end of the 90s, we were just sort of tipping the iceberg in terms of understanding what credentialing is from a civilian perspective and how it might affect the military. Back in 2000, um, actually, before I move on to the, to the next decade, um, one of the other things that happened at the end of the 90s was a federal agency task force was formed, and it was made up of the military services, the Department of Defense, the Department of Labor, the Department of Veterans Affairs, a number of different agencies, um, with the idea of trying to shed some additional light on what could be done to facilitate credentialing. And I thought that um, the general's comments this morning were very apropos because I was at some of those credentialing roundtable meetings and heard firsthand the military services saying, this is not a good idea. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to give somebody essentially a ticket out of the military? Um, so that was sort of the mindset at the end of the 90s. But that changed in 2000. And um, you Army folks can be very proud to say that it was really the Army that facilitated that change. In 2000, the Army created something called the GI to Jobs Working Group. And it was part of then Secretary of the Army White's in it, recruiting incentive program. And it was intended to use credentialing as a way to incentivize people to join the Army. A big portion of that program uh, was focused on establishing the Army Cool program. How many folks here are, have heard of Army Cool? <laughs> a good number of you. So for those of you who haven't, um, it stands for Credentialing Opportunities Online. And basically, it was um, it's a website that captures extensive research that's been conducted to match military occupations, all of the enlisted military occupational specialties, to civilian credentials, um, as well as the warrant officer MOSs. What it does is it provides two kinds of information. It provides general information on credentialing, what it is, why it's important to you as a service member, what are some of the factors that you might consider with regard to whether you want to pursue a credential at various points in your career. But more importantly, it also provides occupation-specific information. And it provides very detailed information for every MOS on the relevant civilian credentials, whether it's a certif national certification, a federal license, a state license, what the requirements are for that credential, and then for selected credentials that the training proponents have identified, it also provides the results of detailed gap analysis that shows how your military training meets <coughs> or, do or doesn't meet the civilian credentialing standards. The, um, the Army Cool website was, again, one of the first times that anybody had really systematically looked across all military occupations. And it really yielded a lot of important information for the military as a whole and not just for the Army. Um, the research for the Army showed that where at the end of the 90s, um, they had estimated that about 30% of military occupations were affected by civilian credentialing. For the Army, we were able to find out that almost every military occupation might have some form of civilian credential associated with it. And the reason that we were able to look at that is because when we did the analysis, we weren't looking just at the primary duties, which was a key portion of it, but we were also looking at some of the embedded skill sets that are associated <laughs> with performing your duties and the training that you've received. Um, most of you are aware military service members all have some forms of collateral duties, um, training-oriented um, leadership, maybe a command fitness leader. There are um, literally thousands of certifications out there, and there have been, they have been linked to every military occupational specialty. One of the other things that was important for the research was that it was an opportunity to identify some of the barriers that folks encountered in terms of soldiers attaining credentials. 
And one of the key barriers that was overcome during that period of time was the lack of information. Soldiers didn't know what they didn't know. They didn't know if there was a civilian certification related to their MOS. They didn't know necessarily what the requirements were. So the Army Cool site um, kind of alleviated that information barrier. The other key piece of information that came out of the research was um, that the credentialing requirements, the types of requirements associated with a specific certification or license are really what's going to drive the ability of a service member to attain the credential. And if you are familiar with certification and licensure requirements, almost all of them have eligibility requirements. It might be a certain um, level of education. It might be a uh, number of semester hours, participation in an accredited program, having a degree. Um, so there's an, there could be an education component. There could be a training component. Um, there's oftentimes an experienced component. You have to have had X number of years of experience doing thus and such um, in order to attain the credential. And then almost always there's um, an exam that's going to be associated with a certification or license. So each one of those types of requirements pose different challenges for service members. And I think what we've learned throughout this is it's the, really the education and training requirements that are going to pose the most significant challenge. Um, and that's because, like we've been talking about all morning, um, the military is really a non-traditional form of education. Uh, civilian credentialing agencies, civilian employers are not accustomed to understanding what goes into military training. So sometimes service members don't get the recognition that they deserve of the training and the education that they've received in the military. The other piece that came out of this research is that there are legitimate gaps between military training and experience and civilian credentialing requirements. And I think that's very important because sometimes I think folks in the civilian sector think that the military is looking for a one-for-one -one exchange. I have military training, give me my certification. And that's not the case. The military trains to a mission, and that's important. Um, and there may be some gaps between what the military trains to and what the civilian requires. Um, so I think that's an important realization that we all have to go into with our eyes open is that there may be legitimate gaps. That, and the key here is what we want is um, credit for the training we have and resources to fill the gaps where necessary. So by the end of the decade, um, the Army had, had instituted the Army Cool Program. The Navy discovered the Army Cool Program and said, hey, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Let's piggyback on it. And the Army, um, like a very good sister service, shared its information and database. And so the Navy was able to, pu to uh, stand up a cool program as well. In the last five years, between 2010 and 2015, I think we're really kind of in a solutions phase. Much of what has been done, well, you know, let's, let's go back to the 90s. We were talking, there were hundreds of certifications in the 90s. Now, in the past five years, there are literally, estimates are about 4,000 professional certifications out there cutting across all occupational areas. So the emphasis on the downsizing of the military in recent years has really put the spotlight on credentialing as a way of enhancing somebody's ability to leave the military and have a successful transition to the civilian workforce. Many of you have probably heard a lot of the um, news stories about the White House initiatives, the congressional um, mandated initiatives that have been going on to facilitate credentialing of service members and veterans. Um, in the past couple of years, the Air Force and the Marine Corps joined with their Army and Navy um, sister services, and they also have implemented COOL programs now. So the, I think what was important during that time period was with the emphasis on transition, what we were seeing is we recognize that a credential may actually be required when you go to the civilian workforce. An employer might say, you have to have this credential or it may be required um, by law if it's a license. But more importantly, a civilian credential in the hands of a transitioning service member is going to help them demonstrate to the civilian employer that their skills are on par with a more traditionally trained civilian applicant. And I think that's the key importance of credentialing for service members and veterans, and it almost makes it more important for them than for the, uh, the individual um, who has not had military service. So where are we now? It's 2015. Um, we'd identified a lot of the barriers, and 
one of the key barriers, in addition to the information dissemination, was the payment of credential fees. Um, Congress, in the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 15, um, has required that all of the services begin paying the credential fees for service members. So as of 2015, each one of the services now have some form of voluntary um, credentialing program where they actually will pay for the certification fees. Um, what we're seeing, though, is that there are some additional barriers that remain. and. I think that this forum here within Army University has been a wonderful time to kind of showcase some of the barriers and think about what all of us can do as stakeholders in this arena to alleviate the barriers. Um, and I'm going to kind of hone in on two that I think are probably most relevant to this group. And the first one is recognizing the equivalency of military training and experience and giving due credit for it. There have been a number of initiatives in recent years that have been designed to raise the awareness, particularly of credentialing organizations and educational institutions, of the equivalency. Um, you've heard folks talk today about the fact that the American Council on Education reviews Army training and makes college credit recommendations associated with it. A lot of educational institutions had been reluctant to accept those credit recommendations because they hadn't understand, understood the uh, process that the American Council on Education uses to go in and evaluate military training, and it's a very rigorous process. So one of the things that has happened in the past year or two is um, ACE has actually gone out to consortia of um, education providers and talked about their process. Um, the National Governors Association sponsored a pro uh, um, credentialing pilot with six states within the past year, and that was one of the key portions of it. What has been interesting is that all of the credentialing pilots that have been undertaken initially are focused on the certification and licensing agencies, but almost always come right back to education providers because education is such a big component of establishing eligibility for a credential. So there's more we can do. Um, bridge training programs is another avenue that educational programs, I mean educational institutions can undertake if you can give credit for the core of the military training and then provide them with additional bridge training just for those gaps, it's going to reduce the amount of time that they have to spend in the classroom. And then the last thing I want to talk about is really this um, national standards as it relates to the quality of credentialing programs. One of the things that we found is there is really no consistent assessment of the quality of certification programs. So we hear a lot about diploma mills and what's being done in order to ensure that service members aren't um, you know, using their well-earned benefits to pay for programs that, that aren't any good. The same is true with the certification program. Um, accreditation of certification programs is a relatively new concept. And for the Army Cool program, as an example, we've linked 1,500 individual certifications to Army military occupations, and of those, less than a quarter of them have actually been accredited. So for COOL, we have undertaken three different methods for ensuring the quality of the credentials that go up on the website, and they all have varying degrees of rigor. The first method is for ensuring quality is what we call kind of caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Give them as much information as you can um, about the accreditation status. So if you go on COOL and you see a certification, it's going to indicate to you immediately whether or not that certification has been accredited by any of the three national accreditors of certification programs, ANSI being one of them, keeping in mind that that type of accreditation is very different than educational accreditation. So you've got that level of information. The second form of quality control that we implement with COOL is to tell you whether or not the program has been approved for payment through the GI Bill. The GI Bill will pay for certification and licensure fees for veterans and active duty military. Um, and the VA has established an approval process. It's not nearly as uh, rigorous as the accreditation process, but it is another level of third party review of a certification. And then the final method of ensuring the quality of information that goes up on COOL is we implement what we call a credential checklist. So for every certification that gets analyzed, we, go, we have identified key criteria that the certification must meet based on the accreditation standards. 
and we go through and we examine the extent to which the certification meets that criteria. If we have any questions about it, we send the um, checklist to the agency and the agency basically has to self-attest to the fact that they have um, met those criteria. So this isn't a foolproof mechanism for ensuring that all of the certifications that have been identified are, are of highest quality. The um, most foolproof method would be to require accreditation of all certification programs. And there's actually been some legislation proposed that would require military, military um, to, to do that if they're going to pay for a credential. Um, that legislation has not passed as of yet, but they're they've revisited it. It was going to be submitted into the NDAA again this year. Um, and I think that what we need to do as stakeholders is kind of grab the reins, make this a grassroots movement, and say, what can we do collectively to promote uh, the quality and the recognition of military training for credentialing purposes? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you are in an active state after the lunch. Otherwise, I'll need to get those things to see what your level of activity this afternoon is. <clears throat> uh, I work for the American National Standards Institute, ANSI. Um, we are about 100-year-old organization, uh, Department of War and Department of Navy, along with Department of Commerce, where uh, the three founding members of ANSI, uh, along with six uh, associations. Uh, when ANSI started, uh, the focus was all about standards for products and processes. Uh, we accredit standards developers like IEEE, uh, ASME, NFPA, so we have over 230 accredited standards developers uh, and over 10,000 American national standards. So from crayons to your debit cards to your cell phones, uh, uh, you know, there are lots and lots of standards that are designated as an American national standard. When I go to Walmart and my son says, hey, dad, this is, uh, this meets American national standard, can you buy it? You know, and I say, okay, no. <laughs> 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 we try. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but over the past, and we also accredit uh, product certifiers, we accredit labs. Uh, one of the newer areas that I'm involved with, and it's been relatively new as Lisa pointed uh, for the past 10 years, uh, is in terms of competence of people. Uh, you know, it started with product and process, and right now it's all about people. You might have the best facility, but if you don't have really competent people to operate those machineries and facilities, you're not going to have a good outcome. So the focus has been, how do you really assess competence of people? How do you make sure that the organizations that are awarding those credentials, uh, whether it's certificate, training, certification, really meet a national standard? So there has, and this is a big international uh, uh, movement right now because all countries are looking in terms of a national capacity building, how can you have a competent workforce because credentials are tied to jobs. So about 10 years back, we started a program to accredit personal certification bodies. As Lisa was saying, there are about 4,000 certification bodies. One of the things that you will find is uh, practically everyone in this country is certified for something or the other. Uh, and when I was looking uh, a couple of years back with the SEC and FINRA, uh, they found out that there were 162 designations for financial planners. So someone could come and say, I'm a certified financial planner. And you would have no idea in terms of what that certification meant. Similarly, you have for crane operators, you have for so many other professions. Uh, and less than 10% of the certifications uh, in this country are actually accredited or meet any kind of national standard. So the big concern was if the army is paying for those certifications, if civilians are pursuing those certifications, how do you have a mechanism? You would not go to an unaccredited university. So why would you want to spend money on certifications that don't meet a national standard? So we have been working uh, to make that happen uh, with, with various uh, stakeholder groups. Uh, the Department of Defense has a directive, 8570, where it, anyone working in cybersecurity that certification, DOD will pay for it only if it's accredited uh, by ANSI under the 17024 program that we have. Uh, and again, the whole, whole, whole reason is to make sure that if you have certification, uh, which is very different from certificate, uh, uh, you know, there is the, the big 
terminology chaos. People keep using the word certified, accredited, registered, licensed, uh, and it, it's an alphabet soup. People say, my program is nationally recognized. And what does that really mean, nationally recognized? Okay, so people are coming up with very innovative terms to make it seem that their training, their education, their university is something better than others. And most of the stakeholders or users of those programs really have no idea in terms of what that really means. So we have been actively working with uh, the White House. We have been working with lots of uh, organizations, the Department of Education, to create a credentialing registry which would help uh, people to know in terms of, okay, what does this really mean? Uh, what's the transparency? What's the value? People are looking to, to invest their life saving in getting some of these credentials. So what does that really mean? Uh, and when you look at the word certification, uh, the certification is all focused on competence. It's not about education. It's not about training. It's about the job. And employers are demanding uh, certifications because they see that as markers of competence. So can you show me that, yes, this person can perform on the job? And if that's the goal, there is this entire science. How do you really create valid assessments, which are psychometrically valid? How do you do a proper job analysis? So it's not just a faculty coming and creating a test. It's a lot that goes be beyond that. Uh, and then about five years back, we created an accreditation program for training and education that results in a certificate. So if you're pro offering training, does that training meet a national standard? How do you know that the training objectives have been clearly defined? How are you making the evaluations? And we found that a lot of trainings are just based on seat time. Uh, they have not been developed based on any, any rubrics. Everyone uses the word, you know, it's competency-based, it's stack credentials, uh, micro-credentials, and badges, but no one really knows in terms of what those terms mean. And, and the users and buyers are really confused because they don't know what that term means. So we created a program where we came up with a national standard in terms of what a quality training or educational program uh, is. Uh, based on uh, you know adult learning principles, how do you do assessments? This morning we're talking about assessments. One of the really big concerns uh, with higher education is we are focusing on process, which is fine, but there is no valid assessment uh, uh, in terms of whether people have really acquired the skills for which they have gone through those training or educational programs. I know you talk about criterion reference assessments, you talk about creating good learning objectives, uh, and most of the faculty don't really know in terms of how do you write good course objectives, how do you create good assessments, how do you really measure learning, and it's not uh, uh, <clears throat> easy because you're trying to define uh, a big competency skill set and trying to make an assessment, not just in terms of what they have learned, but in terms of their ability to perform on the job. And one of the early leaders uh, that we have created uh, under our training certificate program is the US Army Safety Center. Uh, and what, what we have found is like uh, there has been research in terms of looking at the value of accredited certifications, uh, both in terms of quality, market wa value, and job earnings. And some of the research have pointed that you know, there's 20, 30% uh, wage premium if you have an accredited certification. So, so we are trying to promote quality training and education as well as certifications that meet a national standard. And right now, there is a lot more focus on standards for assessing competence of people. Like for instance, there is a new standard which came out last year. If you're doing performance testing, uh, how do you actually do a valid performance testing? So we are seeing a lot of, a lot of new focus on creating standards that are going to help assess competence of people, competence of institutions that award those credentials. So it's really good that we are having this dialogue today about national standards because using some of those frameworks will help us to, to do things right. Thank you, Ms. Lutz. And uh, Dr. Krishna. We will now move into uh, to, uh, Mr. Kent Irvin. Mr. Irvin is a retired soldier with more than 30 years of conventional force and special operations experience. He has served as a brigade commander in the 101st Airborne Division, a battalion commander in the 10th Mountain Division, the Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff Operations and Training in the 6th Infantry Division, and a training, development, and staff officer for the Department of Army in the Pentagon. 
He has served as an Army civilian in training and doctrine command for more than nine years, leading the command's training and education policy and governance efforts to include writing and promulgating Army policies and procedures for the training and education development process and the Army's movement to a modern central database, increasing shared use of selected, standardized learning products among TRADOC's 37 separate schools. Mr. Urban and his division, comprised of soldiers, Army civilians, defense contractors, transferred to the Army University Office of the Vice Provost for Learning Systems on October 1st of this year. Mr. Irvin, the floor is yours. So I've been a member of Army University for 62 days. <laughs> and I'm proud to do it too, by the way. Um, what a privilege uh, it was for uh, me and the men and women that I'm literally honored to serve with on behalf of the Army to move from the organization we were in, and it was a great organization uh, called CAC, Command Arms Center Training, to the Army University when the Army University absorbed the core function of TRADOC for training and education, development, management, and policy. And that's why I'm a, I'm a rules and tools guy, if you will. Uh, I'm also a resource management guy a little bit, but I'm drug into that kicking and screaming. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I called a couple of you in, in the blind to, to find out what you kind of knew about our students in the Army. And so I kind of tailored this to most of our civilian uh, colleagues that are here today that didn't have a lot of Army experience of exactly who it is we're talking about. I have found out from our discussions uh, last night and, and today that many of you from the research universities and like that have a, a kind of an expectation and a, a vision of what the students are as compared to what the Army student population really is. And I'm gonna to try to address a few of those things. Uh, you'll see that some of the slides that I have, uh, my boss's boss, so it was used this morning. And uh, you're gonna hear a few numbers that are different uh, and it has a difference of perspective. Some of you know, but most of you do not know that the commanding general for TRADOC Training and Doctrine Command, is the senior responsible official for a department of the Army that articulates the policies and general guidelines for the training and education development po uh, uh, process for the Army, whether the school centers and activities are inside of TRADOC or outside of TRADOC. And there are a number of schools that are outside of TRADOC. For example, the Army Medical Command has its own separate school outside of TRADOC down at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, which is where our medical professionals go, that follow the TRADOC policies on the training and education development process, but answer to the Surgeon General of the Army, not to the TRADOC commander. Staff as advocate, our military lawyers have the same system, our chaplains have the same system. Most of our professional level technical people that are not the hardcore, what you think of soldiers doing, uh, have their systems and their schools, but they follow the TRADOC guidance. Also, the Army is the leader for some of the joint schools, such as the Joint uh, Munitions Command, where the Army is the senior responsible official for all of the m munitions handlers that come into the Department of Defense, whether they're civilian or military. Our standards are also part of the joint system where our soldiers attend somebody else's school where the Air Force-like is in charge. Uh, emergency Ordnance uh, Disposal, the EOD school, bomb handlers. Our military working dog program is another example of s soldiers that are attending a joint school that is not necessarily with a senior, uh, the senior official is an army, uh, army person. And our needs in relationship to the training and education development process have to be addressed by the joint schools to make sure that we understand what the soldiers learned, keyword learned, learned and what they can do when they come out of the school, okay? I will have to, uh, I have to publicly acknowledge that I do have a, a cohort in crime here that has taught me over the last seven years. His name's Jim Martin, he's sitting over there in the corner, who successfully transitioned me from a training guy to a learning guy. And I am very much a learning guy now, parentheses, training and education. Uh, next slide, please. Our students come from the uh, population of available mil uh, military age personnel, about 33 million in any given year. The, the numbers are basically the same for the last six years, of which only about 7.7 .7 million are really capable of military service based on the screening criteria you, you see here. 
And so our, our potential population for recruits coming into the Army, our new students, uh, is trimmed down considerably. And of those 7.7 million, about 90,000 new students come into the Army every year. Most of them are enlisted soldiers as compared to officers uh, that you would normally see through the West Point or uh, ROTC programs and things like that. So most of our, our student potentials are enlisted. Most of them are 18 to 24, year, 24 years old, and I'll talk about the adult learning model here in just a second and the transition problems that many of our universities face that we face every single day with the 18 to 24 year old population. Uh, next slide, please. You see here basically the four major components of the Army student population. You see the active component soldiers up in the left-hand corner, but we also have reserve component soldiers, National Guardsmen, and Army Reserve soldiers, and you see the apportionment thereof. New to TRADOC here lately, especially under Army University, is the absorption of the, some of the responsibilities for the Army Management Staff Colleges, where the Department of the Army civilians are trained and educated, okay? That is new to the training to our TRADOC system, because here at four under the Assistant Secretary of Manpower and Reserve Affairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it was kind of like a special school, but now it's under coming under the TRADOC umbrella. And the demographics for those students is significantly different than for the soldiers that we bring into the Army. They're usually more mature. And almost all of them walk into the door with a, a, a college degree, whereas most of our enlisted soldiers do not. For our enlisted soldiers, and you see in the upper right-hand corner there, 99% of our, uh, enlist, or our soldiers have a high school degree. That wasn't like uh, for some of us gray-haired guys that are Vietnam era people when we were like if half of them had a degree or a GED. Okay, so almost 99% of our soldiers have a high school degree or more. Almost every commissioned officer has a college degree. And as I said, our, our physicians, our veterinarians, our dentists, uh, they all have professional degrees from the appropriate uh, universities. Uh, down there, you see, they're kind of blurred up. Uh, about 40% of our soldiers are 18 to 24 year old. We have, through the Army uh, learning concept of the Army learning model, we have moved into the adult continuing education aspect of how we are trying to uh, posit the environment for our soldiers to learn. But if I wouldn't have heard this myself, I wouldn't have believed this. Some of the challenges we face that are not normally with the uh, 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 universities are things like when we bring them into the Army, uh, the things of ethics and the things of standards and ex expected behavior. I mean, all you have to do is watch the news to see where some of our young people go, okay? The other aspect is uh, training versus education. There was, and I heard this myself and I didn't believe it, and I asked him to repeat it twice because I am slightly hard hearing. There is a slight time that the drill sergeants, which is where the first learning occurs with our young uh, students when they're enlisted, to make sure that they can tie shoes and boots. I didn't believe this. And he says, you would be surprised. The flip-flop Velcro generation, we wear, we wear shoes and boots, and not everybody that came, comes into the Army wears shoes and boots, and there is a quick check to make sure that we have the psychomotor skill of being able to tie shoes and boots. Okay, so, I mean, we don't normally face that with freshmen that go to uh, University of Oklahoma. However, they, they, we do in uh, Fort Jackson, uh, South Carolina. So that is some, some of the aspects. Our department there in civilians, we don't face that kind of stuff, okay? So we're, we're having to learn this. What I'm trying to show you is the diversity of the, uh, the education and, and uh, learning requirements from the 17, 18 year old crowd to the over 45 crowd. Uh, when they go to the Army War College, they're there to learn to, there to, learn to, uh, to speak strategy and think through uh, the hypothesis of the national defense uh, requirements and the military requirements. And the other end of the spectrum, um, we got drill sergeants that are making sure we can tie shoes and boots. So that is the, um, the diversity of the learning challenges that some of us face. Next slide, please. Our customer, um, I, I kind of telegraphed this last night to some of my panel colleagues. Uh, job one is defense of the United States uh, in our Army learning process. Uh, job one is being able to defend the United States and act on the orders of the President and the directives of Congress. And nobody asks whether you're ready, by the way. They expect you to be ready. 
That's job one. And the other aspect is, as we are preparing our soldiers through the uh, training and education development process, is to operate in a joint environment. And you saw that when General Brown talked about it today. Soldiers in large units don't act by themselves. There's Marines with them. There's Air Force folks with them. There's civilians with them. There are all sorts of folks with them. But the Army has to bring to this table skills, knowledge, and abilities and capabilities of every individual soldier being able to contribute to the organization's capability. Okay? And eventually here, I'm going to tell you, there's 213 different jobs for enlisted soldiers in the Army. Okay? There's all sorts of enlisted jobs. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Hardcore, what you, if you watch television and, 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 and reflect on our military, uh, military operations in Afghanistan and in Iraq, hardcore combat jobs is about 40% of the Army's requirements. As Lisa talked about, 60% of them, I think you use uh, 70 or 80%, 60% of them are not hardcore, kill, capture, destroy the enemy. That's what the Army does and seizes land, okay? 60% of them are not. It is, if you will, the support aspects, military police, medical, dental, human resources, finance, all those things you see there. So as, as we're looking through this and, and seeking you know, national uh, accreditation uh, advice and standards, some of it will be, well, I mean, our infantrymen, our artillerymen, our, our tankers, our air defensemen, you know, those that actually engage with the enemy, I mean, they are well trained. They are well educated. They think strategically. They they are they are wonderful problem solvers. That's what they face every day is problem solving. Well, all this education they got. I mean, where is there a correlation? Well, I found out. How about leadership? How about management? How about yeah, counseling? How about all those things that they do on a daily basis that you know perhaps we're not giving them appropriate credit and walking through the system on how we can do that. Next slide, please. Uh, General Brown talked about this, uh, that we've got uh, a whole bunch of uh, organizations uh, within TRADOC. It goes all the way, and I'll, I'll use a quick pointer here. That's Guam, by the way, over here in the Pacific. It goes all the way to Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and everywhere in between to include Alaska, uh, both in Anchorage and Fairbanks. Uh, so they're scattered all over the United States. And TRADOC, is, I mean, it's a huge. It's not all on one campus. It is huge. Okay? And... 50, 50 state governors and, and four territorial governors have something to say about what happens uh, for their own systems within their own organizations, and that is a challenge that we're looking for some help on. Next slide, please. Uh, I overlaid every institution, civilian the learning institution that I could find that was associated with the trade act schools and centers. And you see here, I counted 94. General Brown had uh, listed 62. I counted 94. I'm sure he's right. I was maybe a little bit more liberal. Uh, the boss is always right. Uh, but anyway, so I looked for, you know, where are all these places? And, and, and one of the things he talked about is that there may not be an active duty school there, but there is a reserve component school somewhere like in Camp Guernsey, Wyoming. Okay, we don't have an active duty school there, but I can tell you we got a reserve component school at Camp Guernsey, Wyoming. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our process. Next slide. It is called Addy. Uh, most of the uh, educators I've talked to today are familiar with this, uh, with this, uh, with this process. Uh, it is a derivative uh, based out of Bloom's taxonomy. It came out of a Florida st uh, State University study that was done, commissioned by the Department of Defense in the mid-1970s. The Army adapted its system from the, uh, from the recommendations from Florida State, and it's called ADI, Analysis, Design, uh, Develop, Implement, and uh, Evaluate. Uh, this is a, uh, an illustrative version of it. There are about four versions that I use on this. The reason that I use this is to show you there is a process that the Army goes through to figure out who needs, who, who needs the learning, what do we expect them to do when we're finished with it, and how did we know that they achieved the learning outcomes when we we're finished. I listened very attentively when we talked about uh, uh, outcomes-based learning. Uh, this morning. I mean, I mean, my, my radars were up, okay? And then I started thinking about basic combat training is nine weeks long, period. <laughs> now, we'll, we'll, we'll teach those soldiers anything that the senior leaders of the Army want them taught, but it's nine weeks long, period. And there are certain learning objectives that have to be obtained. Uh, the youngsters, you need to go to sleep. I mean, you know, 24-7 sounds good until you have to do it. 
uh, the drill sergeants need to get some rest. So I'm kind of looking through this on how it is we can, uh, you know, look at our process and maybe, you know, tweak it a little bit. Next slide, please. Uh, and our standardization, next slide, please. Uh, not necessarily, and again, when you go through all the jobs, 213 enlisted jobs, 56 uh, warrant officer jobs, and 46 uh, different uh, jobs for officers. And there are, I think, 54 uh, Department of the Army and career program uh, fields uh, that we have to look at. Every school is different. Absolutely every school is different. However, when you look at the management process with us, the Pentagon, and Congress, then there are some standardization issues that I've got to address on what the soldiers learned, how they learned it, and how much it costs. Next slide, please. I love this slide, <laughs> okay? And I stole it from my boss who stole it from my bo his boss who stole it from somebody else's boss. I love this slide, okay? Uh, the soldiers that come through our learning system are smart. Uh, this may sound like a, a, a trite phrase we use often. This is the best educated army in the history of the United States. And they, I mean, they problem, they problem solve every day at the 18, 19 year old level, just like General Brown said, strategic mistakes by a spec four on camera. Okay, they are smart and they are good and they want to learn. And our challenge right now is to entice the learning, look for ways to, to make them excited and to be able to apply the learning when they leave the army. I'm a three for, three for one guy. General Brown articulated that most of our soldiers leave the army when they're finished with their tour of duty. What a wonderful recruiting tool. Well, where'd you learn this, youngster? I learned this in the Army. And here's my certificate. One, okay, we talk about, you know, uh, uh, unemployment. And two, what a wonderful recruiting tool for the next generation of soldiers. I learned this in the Army. Okay, I can do this because of the Army or the application. And the other one is for civilian credentialing. How great it would be for a, an engineer officer to learn engineering and do it to the Army standard and yet, with civilian credentialing, think outside the box and even do it better. Engineering is an example. The electronic warfare is an example. Intelligence is an example. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. Our final panel member this afternoon is Dr. Chris Reynolds. Dr. Reynolds currently serves as the Dean of Academic and Outreach and Program Development at American Public University System which includes the American Military University. In this role, he oversees faculty and program innovation, which meets the university's strategic goal of encouraging and supporting faculty communication, dialogue, and community development. Previously, Dr. Reynolds served as the Dean for the Center for Teaching and Learning, CTL, which included overseeing the faculty development of more than 2,500 faculty members. The primary role was to support teaching and learning with resources dedicated to the development of courses and curriculum, instructional technology, student success, and faculty development. Dr. Reynolds also served at six years as the program director for the Emergency and Disaster Management, Explosives and Ordnance Disposal and Homeland Security programs, which consisted of both undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Dr. Reynolds, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, first, I want to say it's a pleasure to be here. Like my colleagues on the panel, I really appreciate this opportunity. You know, a lot, a lot of good information has been passed on, and this morning uh, our, our keynote speaker brought up a lot of good information, as did all of our panel members. And two things that actually came out of nowhere that I want to talk about very quickly because they're relevant to exactly what, what the last speaker just brought up was the whole idea of uh, providing opportunity to our men and women that are leaving the military, not just the Army, but all the, the services. And, uh, you know, the skill sets that they bring. Now, I was in the Air Force back right after Desert Storm when the big drawdown hit. And they started, you know, basically buying out contracts from, off, not buying contracts out, but offering incentives for young officers and, and senior enlisted to retire early. And a lot did. And a lot uh, didn't have anywhere to go. Well, uh, a program called Troops to Teachers was spun up and started. And that's a program that's been successful to this very day where people coming out of the military have the opportunity to possibly become a school teacher. Now there's other requirements that have to be met, but that's one of them. Another are corporate partners where you've got, for example, Walmart Corporation who has a, a, a entity within Walmart that's stood up completely on its own that hires specific 
veterans. And if you've got a veteran who, say, is a loggy coming out, uh, Walmart's liable to hire that individual and put them right into logistics because they have that skill set. Now, do they have the certifications? Well, one doesn't know. But there are those opportunities for those veterans coming out, so I think it's worthy to mention that. So this whole idea about standards and this whole idea about what are the skills that can be quantified while in uniform, while going to the service schools, what are the certifications that the service members bring out and what crosses over into the civilian world? Now, you know, there are a lot of, we talked about some of the schools earlier that uh, the Army has, the joint schools. For example, Fort Sam, you know, you've got uh, the program out there where all the uniformed services attend. You know, we, in fact, I was involved in a conference call just yesterday regarding the pharmacy certification program where we have pharmacy techs that are going through Fort Sam and they come out as techs. Well, are they certified? Do they get the board certification? Well, if they meet the 614 contact hours and take the test, they do. Well, what does that mean for that pharmacy tech coming out of the Army? Well, it means they're a certified tech. They're nationally certified. It gives them opportunity anywhere in the country to get a job. So that's the, that's the crossover. In 1995, I was assigned to U.S. Headquarters Special Operations Command under the command surgeon with Colonel Steven Yevich. He was the Army 06 that commanded. He was command surgeon. Part of my job back then was working with our special operations combat medics uh, out of the joint medical readiness uh, site up at, uh, at Fort Bragg. And part of that was spinning up a brand new program called Nationally Registered Emergency Medical Technicians, NREMTs. Uh, the desire for the sink back then, which is Wayne, General Wayne Downing, was that all SOCA medics would be nationally certified EMT slash P's, paramedics. Part of that program is we sent them to leave the schoolhouse up at Fort Bragg and actually do their clinical times in the city of New York, ride with the city of New York the city of fire department and do their rescue contact hours. And they would then, not only were they then combat medics in the joint services, whether they were uh, Air Force pararescue, they were Navy Corpsman SEAL medics, or they were you know, 18 Deltas in the Army. They had that NASA certification. So when they left the service, they carried that certification with them. They then were employable anywhere in the country because they had that NREMT cert, which is extremely important. Now, the same is true, too, with disaster management. And, you know, again, towards the end of my Air Force career, I had a chance to serve as an emergency preparedness liaison officer in EPLO, assigned to 1st Air Force at Tyndall, that I actually worked with 5th Army. And we worked with 10 FEMA regions and with the DCOs. Now, there were a lot of certifications that went along with that with my sister services where people that were either at a, at a jock, a joint operations center, or a talk, tactical operations center have specific skill sets that correlate over to civilian job sets. Well, how do we identify what those are? Well, you know, Lisa talked about the cool site. That's one way we can do that. And what's another way we can do it? Well, another way is by doing ACE, looking at the American, you know, the, the ACE certification guide. A lot of times the training and education, which are based on knowledge, skills, abilities, KSAOs they call them, correlate over to higher education. And at American Military University, we use the same accreditation standard that any other higher learning commission accredited institution uses to look to see what the credits are coming in. So the important thing is that we identify what are young men and women coming out of the military as well as retired folks bring out to the table with them. The standard paradigm in the military has been union-based, which you know, goes back to the old three-level, five-level, seven-level for enlisted. The journeyman, the craftsman, you know, the, uh, the trade, the, essentially language and skills that are based in a union paradigm. That's not a bad thing necessarily, but it really doesn't correlate over to certification or any type of a higher ed type of a uh, capability unless they've got a portfolio or unless they've got you know, a skill set that they can quantify to say, well, let's look at the rubric, let's see what they did, and let's grade that against what the learning outcomes are for whatever program that we have. And we've also worked and done that as well. Another thing I think that we should look at, and this, this is probably going to stick the eye in the face of a lot of folks that are traditional higher ed, because I'm not traditional higher ed. I'm a person that worked his entire life and went on to school with my post-9-11 GI Bill. That's basically how I got where I am. So... When I talk about this, it, it sometimes sticks to the craw of a lot of my, my higher ed colleagues, but 
you know, do we need to look at Bloom's taxonomy and maybe just completely rework that and look at it more from a standpoint of our experiential credit that we have or even look at our co-curricular activities? If you've got a soldier or an airman or, you know, whomever attending a joint service school, there are uh, – operating within that training based on established guidelines and procedures that are mixed, met against perhaps an ANSI standard that my colleague Vijay talked about, why could we not say, well, you know what, that meets the blooms criteria, therefore it is upper level or it is mid-level. I think that we need to be more liberal with how we look at and provide credit to our young men and women and retirees coming out of the military because they bring a lot to the table. I had an old master sergeant one time tell me back when I was a second lieutenant, he'd say, Lieutenant, you can't teach experience. And you know you can't. You cannot teach experience. And all the acronyms and degrees a person has doesn't mean a thing if they can't tie their boot. Right, sir? <laughs> the last thing that, that I just want to talk about, too, and this sort of relates to this, this whole discussion, is that we are very fortunate where we are at, at American Military University. One of our board members is General Treffery. How many know who General Treffery is? Well, you know, I know that I'm, I'm speaking to the, the, I'm preaching to the crowd here. General Treffery is, is, a, is a mentor of mine. I admire this man so much for his, his humility because he's one of the most humble people you'll ever meet in your life. And the impact that he's made, not just on the Army, but on the services, and the impact he's made on us at American Military University uh, says a lot, and it's always taught us to make sure that we provide any and every opportunity that we can to our, our soldiers, uh, our men and women in uniform. So it's not about, you know, uh, we're green, we're purple, we're a joint service, and uh, General Treffery's helped preach.